Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your favorite quarterback hater, Robert Mathis, and you're listening to the For the Culture Podcast. This is the For the Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, back with another For the Culture Q&A. Jumping right into question number one. How much of an impact will losing two preseason games have on our chemistry, and what does it mean for guys like Eason, Blankenship, and the undrafted rookies? Well, let's start off with the chemistry. Will it impact the Colts' chemistry in a negative way? I would lean towards yes, but not just two preseason games getting canceled, because as we know, teams are playing their starters less and less in the preseason as the years go on. We basically would not see, in my opinion, we probably wouldn't see Phillip Rivers in the first or fourth game anyway. So if you want to give him reps, you're going to give it to him in the second and third game, which will turn into just this year giving him snaps in those two games that we're going to have. So I don't think that the chemistry will be affected as much based on losing those two preseason games. But we already lost OTAs, and what will training camp look like? I think that's a huge question that nobody really knows the answer to at this moment. Will it be a normal training camp, or will it be a COVID-19 restricted training camp with social distancing and not having the proper amount of meetings and reps? So I think that's the question. What will training camp look like? Because if training camp has a laundry list of restrictions where you can't go about your business in a normal fashion, then I think the Colts will definitely have chemistry issues because we do have a new quarterback coming in. We have new additions like Xavier Rhodes and DeForest Buckner on the defensive side of the football. We have a lot of rookies who I think are going to be impact players in year one. So the Colts are lucky that they have their coaching staff for the most part returning. We have both coordinators and the head coach returning from last year. So at least we don't have to implement a whole new system this year. Like teams that have brand new coaching staffs, they're going to have a ton to implement in a short period of time. So the Colts are lucky that they do have their coach returning, their coordinators returning, and a majority of the coaching staff back from 2019. I think that's huge. And we do have a new quarterback, but we have a quarterback who played for Frank Reich and Nick Sirianni in San Diego. So at least he's a little bit familiar with the terminology. You look at Teddy Bridgewater going to the Panthers. You look at Cam Newton going to the Patriots. You look at Tom Brady going to the Bucks. All those quarterbacks going to new systems, playing for coaches they've never played for before. So at least Phillip Rivers has a level of familiarity with the Colts coaching staff with Reich's offense and Sirianni's offense. So I think that's a big plus. So will the Colts chemistry be impacted from losing preseason games and COVID-19 restrictions? Yeah, I would say that we will get off to a slower start week one, but I think every team will. I think every team's going to have some level of issues going into the season, but not just because you're losing two preseason games, because as we know, starters are playing less and less and less now in the preseason. You really don't even see starters play too much in the first, and then you never see them play in the fourth preseason game. So either way, I don't even know if we would have seen Phillip Rivers in week one or week four of the preseason, which means... The only guys who really get hurt by this are guys who are battling to make the roster. So I think the chemistry issues for the Colts and all 32 teams are going to come because we already lost OTAs and we're going to have possible restrictions in training camp. So I think that's where the chemistry issues will come, not so much the preseason. But the second part of this question, how does that impact guys like Eason, Blankenship, and the undrafted rookies? Eason, not so much really, as much as the other guys, anybody who's really battling for a spot, because I believe Eason's safe. So I think Eason is one of three quarterbacks who's going to make this roster. I think it's going to be Phillip Rivers, Jacob Brissett, Jacob Eason. So I think Eason is safe. I don't think he needs to prove his worth. I don't think he needs to earn that roster spot. Right now, I think he's already on this roster, and he would have to be catastrophically bad for the Colts to release him this summer. So I don't think losing the preseason games hurts his chances of making the roster. It snaps, it's reps he's not going to get, but I don't think it snaps he necessarily needs to make this roster. I think he could play himself off it before he plays himself on it, which means losing preseason games might actually help him make the roster, if anything, because less opportunity for him to play himself off the roster because right now he's not in the Colts' plans for 2020. He's going to make the roster. He's going to be a backup. He's going to be a third-string quarterback, and we're probably not going to see him at all during the season. I hope we don't see him at all during the season this year because if we see him, that means Jacobia Rivers either got hurt or they had COVID or they had something keeping them from playing, and then you're going to be down to your third quarterback in Jacob Eason. So we don't expect to see Eason this year. I think as fans, we lose out because if we have four preseason games, you don't see Phillip Rivers week one or week four. You probably don't see Jacoby too much week one. You probably don't see him week four, which means we would have got to see a lot of Jacob Eason in the preseason. So as a Colts fan 
who is looking at Jacob Eason as our potential future franchise quarterback. That's what we all hope he's going to be. We all hope he turns into that guy. Now, there's no guarantee he's the future franchise quarterback for the Colts, but we all want Eason to eventually be that guy. Then we never have to use a first-round pick, a second-round pick on a quarterback because we just got a steal in the fourth round because Jacob Eason fell to us in the 2020 draft. So I think as fans, we're getting ripped off because I was looking forward to watching him in the preseason because after this preseason, we're not going to see him until the 2021 preseason. So I would have liked to have seen him, but I don't think that losing two preseason games impacts his chances of making the roster at all. Then you look at a guy like Blankenship, and you could put Blankenship in there with Chase McLaughlin. Those are two guys battling for one kicking spot on this roster, and I don't think it necessarily hurts Blankenship or McLaughlin. It's just less of an opportunity for them to battle out. So McLaughlin does have NFL game experience already. Maybe that does give him the edge now in a shortened preseason, but they're going to battle in camp. They're going to battle in those two preseason games, and hopefully the best kicker wins. I had somebody ask me, and it might even be in this thread later in the Q&A. Somebody asked me, who do I want to win the kicking battle? I don't care. Just give me the best kicker. I have no bias. Do I think Blankenship has a higher ceiling? Yes. Do I want the guy with the higher ceiling? Yes. But I'm not necessarily rooting for one guy or the other. Just give me the best kicker. Give me a kicker who's not going to be sub-70 on extra points this season because that cost the Colts multiple games last year. So I want the best kicker to win the job. And then the final part of this question, how does it impact the undrafted rookies. Those are the guys who get impacted the most by preseason games getting canceled. Because every year people say, oh, we don't need four preseason games. Cut it down to two. Make it a one. We don't need the preseason. The preseason is meaningless. Well, I think that preseason is meaningless for starters. It's meaningless for superstars. It's meaningless for pro bowlers and all pros. But it's not meaningless to that back end of the roster guy. It's not meaningless to Doris Fallon battling Desmond Patman for that sixth wide receiver spot or Marcus Johnson battling for that spot. It's not meaningless to the undrafted rookie who's trying to earn his way and scratch and claw to make a roster to get a paycheck to feed his family. Those guys are fighting for jobs in the NFL and they're fighting for paychecks and they're fighting just to have a chance and you want to give opportunities to those guys. So losing two preseason games is huge for the undrafted rookies in a negative way and I feel really bad for them because that's their opportunity. There's guys who hang around 2, 3, 4 years battling in the preseason to finally get that opportunity to play on Sunday. So I feel bad for the undrafted rookies, any fringe roster cuts, guys who are trying to make the roster because the team might say, "You know what? We're going to go with the safe choice. We're going to go with Marcus Johnson." over Dereese Fallon because we've seen Marcus Johnson do it and Dereese Fallon got his opportunity cut short this offseason because we only had two preseason games instead of four preseason games and we had to get the starters reps and there was just not enough of an opportunity for Fallon to win the job or anything like that. So I feel bad for undrafted guys. I feel bad for late round picks. I feel bad for CFL guys or XFL guys trying to make their mark in the NFL because those are the guys who are going to be impacted the most by this. Do you think the Patriots pose a significant threat to the Colts with the addition of Cam Newton? That's a great question by John, and it's also John's birthday this week. So happy birthday to John Rain. It's his birthday this week. Happy birthday. Hope you enjoy the show. Appreciate all the support through the years. So do the Patriots pose a significant threat to the Colts with the addition of Cam Newton? Of course, because they are the New England Patriots. So everybody in the AFC has to look at the Patriots as a threat. Now, are they our largest threat? No, of course not. That would be, I would say, one, the Kansas City Chiefs, two, the Baltimore Ravens, and then three, the New England Patriots. Because right now, I would say the Colts are still the third best. Like right now, I would say it's Chiefs, Ravens, Colts, Patriots, one through four. I think the Chiefs win the West. I think the Ravens win the North. I think the Colts win the South. I think the Patriots win the East. And I thought the Patriots were my favorite to win the East even before they signed Cam Newton. Because if we're being honest, I'm answering this question with or without Cam Newton. I always just assume the Patriots are going to be a threat. Bill Belichick is still their head coach. They're still the New England Patriots. They will still find a way to cheat or get some type of competitive edge. They still have a really, really good defense, and they are the New England Patriots, and that division is just not all that good. Miami is getting better. The Jets are getting better. Buffalo made the playoffs last year, but Buffalo hasn't won an AFC East title since 1990. The Colts actually won an AFC East title before the last time the Buffalo Bills won an AFC East title because the Bills' last division championship was in 1995. The Colts' last division championship as an AFC East contender was in 1999. We left that division in 2002, and we've been in the AFC South ever since. So we haven't been in that division in 18 years, and we've won it more recently 
recently than the Buffalo Bills. No disrespect to the current Bills roster who hasn't been there for a majority of the past 25 years since the last time the Bills won that division, but we're talking about the New England Patriots. We're talking about Bill Belichick and that defense, and Tom Brady was a shell of himself the past couple of years. He's been the ultimate game manager the past few seasons with the Patriots. They won a Super Bowl two years ago. I think he threw more interceptions and touchdowns on the playoff run. So with or without a healthy Cam Newton, I'm answering this question as do the Patriots pose a significant threat And I think the answer to that question is yes. Now, I also think the Colts are going to be a better team than the Patriots. And I'm answering this question with or without the addition of Cam Newton. Because I honestly don't know how healthy Cam Newton is. Now, if Cam Newton is healthy, it's a great move by the Patriots. You know Bill Belichick will get the most out of Cam Newton. You know he's going to coach him up properly. But what does Cam Newton have left in the tank? I don't know the answer to that question. He hasn't won a game as a starter since 2018. Andrew Luck's won a game more recently than Cam Newton's won a game. And Ben Roethlisberger's won a game. If you want to put that on record. But Cam Newton, the last time we saw him, was awful. We're not talking about 2015 MVP caliber Cam Newton. Now, if he's healthy, could Belichick bring that Cam back from the dead? Yeah, I think he could. But we just don't know if Cam's healthy. He was outplayed by Kyle Allen the last season and a half he was awful awful last year in the two games we saw him he was awful go back and watch that game against the bucks he was as bad as any starting quarterback in the league last year so is he healthy or is it permanently damaged i think that's the question because if his arm is permanently damaged and he's never going to be the same quarterback again then there's nothing bill belichick could do but if he's healthy there isn't a better coach out there than bill belichick to get him back on track so Of course, the Patriots pose a threat. They always do. They're the Patriots. But I would go Chiefs 1, Ravens 2, Colts 3, Patriots 4. And I think the Colts match up really, really well with the Chiefs. If I were a Chief fan, I would not want to see the Colts in the playoffs. Because what we were able to do last year, going to Arrowhead Stadium with Jacoby Brissett posting, I think, his lowest QBR of the season and just bullying them up front with our line. Now we add DeForest Buckner Darius Leonard didn't even play in that game, mind you. So add Leonard back into the mix. Add DeForest Buckner. Upgrade the quarterback from Jacoby to Phillip Rivers. If I were a Chiefs fan, I would not want to see the Colts in the playoffs. If you could sign any player to a 10-year deal on this team, who would it be? Well, we don't have a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes, a quarterback who you could lock up for 10 years and you know he plays the most important position on the field. But we do have two all-pro caliber players who will be 25 or younger week one. So that contract Mahomes guy was great. I would have given that to Andrew Luck in a heartbeat. But right now I would be between Quentin Nelson and Darius Leonard. So it really just boils down to which position do you think is more valuable? That left guard spot or the weak side linebacker spot in the 4-3 defense? Darius Leonard has been a little bit more injury prone. I would not say he's an injury prone player, but in comparison to Quentin Nelson, who's 32 for 32, two seasons in, back to back first team All Pro, you really couldn't be better than Quentin Nelson. If you move Quentin Nelson from left guard to left tackle and had the same level of production, it wouldn't even be a question to be Quentin Nelson 10 out of 10 times. But Darius Leonard has just been so good. Quentin Nelson has just been so good. They're both so young. I think they're both 24 right now. Leonard will be 25 week one, and Quinn Nelson will be 24 the entire season. So it's a tough question because, A, you don't really want to give any non-quarterback a 10-year contract. But with the durability up until this point of Quinn Nelson, I'd probably lean towards big Q. But weak side linebacker could be viewed as the more important position, especially with our scheme. And Leonard has just been a absolute beast the last two seasons for the Colts but you have two all pro players under the age of 25 so I would go probably Quentin Nelson Darius Leonard maybe Darius Leonard than Quentin Nelson but one of those two guys even though 10 years for a non-quarterback would be a very large deal and you'd have to set it up in a team-friendly way because 10 years a decade of asking a linebacker especially a linebacker who's running all over the field to stay healthy would be asking for a lot So I'd probably lean towards Quentin Nelson. How many seasons do you reckon the Colts media slash fans give Ballard slash Reich in Indy if they don't produce? I love the team they're building and coaching, but Indy media will start to eat them alive if they don't bring home some hardware 
with these teams. With that being said, I have 100% faith in them. Well, I think they have to make the playoffs this year because if they don't make the playoffs, the criticism will begin. Seats will begin to heat up. I don't think they're going to get fired if they miss the playoffs after this year, but I think the criticism will begin because right now there's excuses and there's logical reasons. There's good, solid reasons as to why Chris Ballard is under 500 when he's been as good as he's been building an offensive line, building a defense, putting all these pieces on the field, hiring Frank Reich. And it's because the first year he was here, Andrew Luck was hurt. You were inheriting a awful roster. I don't care what Dan Dockett says from Ryan Grigson. And then you go into year two, you win all those games, you win 10 games, you go 10 and 6, you go to the playoffs, you win a playoff game. The next year you have all these expectations in year three, and your quarterback retires two weeks before the season in week three of the preseason. So you have to cut Ballard some slack as to why his teams are under 500 up until this point. In 2017, I give that 4-12 and record to Ryan Grigson. I really do. I mean, I don't know how you could take that record and put it on to... Chris Ballard's permanent record. Like, to me, that roster was as bad as it was. The quarterback was injured because of the previous regime. And the head coach was Chuck Pagano. So you had the old regime's head coach and his coaching staff. You don't have the quarterback. And then in year three, the quarterback retires. So right now, I don't think you could criticize Ballard for his record. But the record does exist. So if you go into this year and you start to lose... And you missed the playoffs after adding Phillip Rivers, after adding DeForest Buckner, after adding Xavier Rhodes, after having what we think to be another really, really good draft class. And you have all these all-pro players and these Pro Bowl players and you're bringing in a new quarterback. You have to make the playoffs. So if they miss the playoffs this year, I think criticism from fans and media will begin. And then you're going to have a lot of pressure in 2021. Because if you miss the playoffs this year, I would have to assume that Phillip Rivers was awful. So if Phillip Rivers is awful, you're going to have your back against the wall to fix the quarterback spot in one year. And then that means going out and getting Aaron Rodgers or doing something to have a quick fix to make the playoffs and win an AFC championship, go to a Super Bowl, or do something big in 2021. If you're Ballard, you can't miss the playoffs three times in four years when we consider him a football genius. I really consider him a genius in terms of roster construction, talent evaluation. So this is a big year for Ballard. To make the playoffs, Frank Reich, it's his third year. Ballard, it's his fourth year. So Reich, if you make the playoffs, that's twice in three years. Ballard, you really don't want to fall to one and three. So I think Ballard gets to the playoffs this year for the second time in four years. Reich for the second time in three years. Is this receiving core going to be able to move the chains when the running game is struggling? I don't see these guys really getting open enough. Well, they were getting open plenty last year and they were nowhere near as talented as this year's receiving core is going to be if you go back to last year and you watch the tape they are open Jacoby might not have seen them the ball might not have been released on time the ball might not have got there most of the time it didn't get there but guys were creating separation Zach Pascal, Marcus Johnson they were creating separation the quarterback was not able to get the ball out in time And this year, you're going to have, hopefully, a healthy T.Y., a healthy Paris, the addition of Michael Pittman Jr. So I think that the Colts receiving core is much improved this year. I think just by getting healthy and then adding Pittman, I think they're a much improved core. And the first part of this question is, will they be able to move the chains when the running game is struggling? I don't expect the running game to ever be struggling at any point this season. As long as the offensive line stays healthy, one through four, I love this running back core. I think that Taylor's going to have a great rookie season. I think Marlon Mack is in the prime of his career. And Jordan Wilkins, your fourth string running back, assuming that Naheem Hines is more of a flex guy and isn't going to carry the ball too much, the weakest link in our running back room is Jordan Wilkins, who's averaging 5.8 yards per carry after over 100 career carries. So I don't think we're going to struggle running the football much this season, and I think as a whole, our offense is going to be much, much, much more productive than it was in 2019. First off, love the pod. Thank you, Max. Second, I was wondering if and when Bobby Okariki will replace Walker as the Mike linebacker. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I think we will see an increase in snaps for Okariki, but Walker is a really solid player. He's always in the right spot. 
He makes Darius Leonard better. Leonard makes him better. They're really comfortable playing alongside each other. I love all three of these linebackers. Obviously, you can't take Leonard off the field. I think Okariki will start to take more snaps, especially passing down snaps away from Walker. But I think Walker will still be on the field on first down, maybe first, second down. Then Okariki will be on the field in those two linebacker sets in passing situations to get that length and that speed and just that athleticism on the field. But that question is really more of a March of 2021 question. Do we re-sign Walker or does Bobby Okariki become the Mike? And then when you go with those three linebacker sets and you have a Sam on the field, you have EJ Speed. And then you have the trifecta as far as long, athletic, freaks of nature go at the linebacker position because then you could have Leonard, Okariki and Speed all on the field at the same time. And I always joke, if they link arms together, I think they could go from sideline to sideline. They just have ridiculously long arms. They're tall. They're fast. They're strong. But Anthony Walker, although he doesn't check those same boxes, he's not the same combine athlete, he's a really solid, good tackler, professional linebacker who is going to make a strong case to be re-signed in Indianapolis. Plus, Darius Leonard loves playing alongside him, which is going to be tough to say, you know what, Leonard, we're taking away your right-hand man. So I think this is more of a 2021 question, but I do think Okariki will see an increase in snaps in 2020. Who has the best chance to have a breakout year, Paris Campbell or Naheem Hines? Definitely Naheem Hines. Hines has played in all 32 games his first two seasons. Paris Campbell had three surgeries last year, had four injuries, only played in seven games. He was banged up all year long. So I think both players have the potential to break out. But if I had to choose one, I would have to go with the durable guy who we've already seen start to break out because Hines would have had a much better year last year if he had a quarterback who was able to get the ball off quicker. This year he has that guy in Phillip Rivers. Plus we've seen him start to emerge already and break out on special teams with the two touchdown punt returns against the Carolina Panthers. So I would definitely go with Neem Hines. It's not a shot at Paris Campbell, but Paris has to prove to us that he could stay healthy. If he could stay healthy, I have high hopes. I think he'll be a really good player, but he has to prove to us that he could stay healthy. Chances we have a season with fans. I don't know the answer to that question. Everybody thinks they know what's going on with COVID-19. Everybody has an opinion. I have a ton of opinions. But nobody actually knows what the future holds. Nobody knows what it will be like in September, October, November. So right now, I would probably lean towards no fans. I think Jacksonville said they were going to have like 25% capacity of fans. But I just feel like it's going to be all or nothing. You either have fans or you don't. If I had to guess, I would say no fans this season. But maybe it's a team-by-team thing, city-by-city. Some cities are worse than other cities. But right now, I would lean towards no fans. But that's just my opinion. Everybody has an opinion. Nobody really knows what the future holds as far as what these games will look like, if we even have games this season. How much do you think our offense will improve from last year to this year? I think it'll improve greatly. Now, the offensive line has to stay healthy because I think that's the only area we didn't improve. Now, the starters are the starters. They're phenomenal. If they stay healthy, if we get... 16 starts from all five starters as we did last year. This offense won't skip a beat because we upgrade the quarterback position. We upgrade the running back position. I think we even upgrade the tight end position. I know we lost Eric Ebron. I think that might be an addition by subtraction. Plus we add Burton and then I think we upgrade the running back position. So the only area on this team where we got worse, especially at least offensively, the only area we got worse, I would say, is the backup O-line. We lost O-line depth. We lose Josh Andrews, and we lose Joe Haig. So we lose depth on the offensive line. The starters, phenomenal. So if we stay healthy, I think that this offense will hands down improve because we improve at every position except the backup O-line. But the starters, all five are returning, and all five stayed healthy last year. So if we could duplicate the health of the O-line, we'll be solid. If the Colts go 9-7 and seven or 10-6 and six with a healthy Rivers, Do you want him back for another year, assuming no playoffs? If we miss the playoffs this year, I think we move on from Phillip Rivers. I believe last year the Colts finished 8-8 with a healthy Jacoby Brissett. He missed those two games. If he plays in both, I think we win at least one. If we win one, that's 8-8. If Phillip Rivers makes a one or a two-game difference, that would be a disappointment in my opinion. Now, 10-6. First off, 10-6 is automatically making the playoffs. 
because we increase from six playoff teams to seven playoff teams. Ten and six normally gets you in in a six-team playoff format. Nine out of ten years, ten and six gets you in. Now we increase from six to seven playoff teams. Ten and six, in my opinion, is a guaranteed automatic playoff berth. So with Phillip Rivers, 10-6 and six in the playoffs, I would say he's back. But we go 9-7. and seven. We missed the playoffs after missing the playoffs last year. And now this would be the third time in four years under Chris Ballard. I think Rivers would have to be gone. And then you try to lure Aaron Rodgers to Indianapolis. You try to make a move like that and then go all in in 2021. But I think the Colts are going to win 10-plus and make the playoffs. So I don't think it's going to matter. What do you expect the NFL season to be like due to the pandemic? Man, I don't know. Everybody has an opinion, but nobody actually knows what the future holds. I wish I could tell you. I think it will be different. I don't think we're going to have fans. I hope, I pray to God we get through the season. Watching what happens in the MLB and the NBA and the NHL in late July and August will be an indication of what's to come, but... One thing I'll give Roger Goodell, he always makes sure the show goes on. Say what you want about Roger Goodell. We all have our problems. I'm not a big fan of Goodell by any stretch of the imagination, but he always makes sure the show goes on. And I respect him because of that. He always makes sure there's football. We still had a draft. We still had free agency. When nothing else was on, he's always capitalizing on his investment. I respect that as a fan. Now, is it always in the best interest of the players? No, but as a fan, we always seem to get what we want and then some. Because some stuff I don't want. I don't want a 17th game. I don't want a 7th playoff team, but they're going to do whatever it takes for money. And then they add a 17th game, we're all watching Week 18. All of us. They add another playoff seed, we're all watching that third wild card game, wild card weekend. So, no matter what they do, we always tune in. When we tune in, they make more money. But one area I'll always give Roger Goodell, especially over Rob Manfred in the MLB, in baseball, we see a lot of problems. Oh, we might not have baseball this year. With football, with Goodell, the show always goes on, which I respect about Goodell and I like about Goodell because we never have to worry about football being canceled or football not playing. The show goes on with Roger Goodell. What happened to your Chuck Pagano videos? Those were pure gold. Well, listen, listen. What happened with Chuck Pagano was he got fired. And when he got fired, he went to the Chicago Bears, and now he's... She's coaching with the Bears, the big Grizzly Bears up in Chicago and got got Mac on defense and, you know, not 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 Mac and Cheese and Cheese and Mac and Mac and Cheese and Frank and Mac, but, uh, you know, real good linebacker in Mac. So, you know, we're, we're, we're satisfied. Mitch Trubisky, best quarterback I've ever seen, better than 12. So, you know, we're, we're really happy in Chicago. You know, uh, Home Alone took place in Chicago. Great, great city, great place. Uh, no steak and shake with shucks. You know, no Shane Elmo's, but, uh, you know, there's still some really good places. here. I just went to this new restaurant on the, on the corner. It was a uh, big yellow M called McDonald's. Uh, best best hamburger I've ever had. They call it a Big Mac. So uh, definitely be back there. But, uh, yeah, no. the reason we don't do the Chuck videos anymore is because Chuck is no longer with us in Indianapolis. But when we play the Bears this year, there might be an appearance from Chuck Pagano on the For the Culture podcast. We might have a Chuck Pagano special the week we play the Chicago Bears. We might spoof his return against the Colts coaching debut because last year we saw him in the preseason didn't really count when we see him this year in the regular season maybe we'll break out a little something special a little throwback Thursday for Chuck Pagano coaching against the Colts this year chances of a full season I don't know man I can't really answer that question because I don't as Chuck would say I don't have a crystal ball so I don't know what the future holds I hope, I pray we get through the season. I hope no players get it, but players will get it. And I think my real question is, like, what happens if Patrick Mahomes gets it? Like, what if Patrick Mahomes gets COVID the week of the AFC Championship or the week of the Super Bowl? Or what if stars start to drop, especially in the NBA? Could you imagine an NBA game? Because football is about the game. Football is about... Because it doesn't really matter. You could have the Jaguars play the Browns on Thursday Night Football. People are still going to watch. But you're not going to watch two basketball teams with no superstars. In basketball, the superstars drive the game. It's a star-driven sport. In football, it's really about the shield. It's not about 
the individual athlete. That's why the NFLPA get their ass kicked every time there's a collective bargaining agreement. In the NBA, the players run the league. So it's all about LeBron James and Giannis Antetokounmpo and Kawhi Leonard and Kevin Durant. So what happens if LeBron James gets it in the Western Conference Finals? Could you imagine a Western Conference Finals without LeBron James because he has COVID-19? Like, what do you do in that scenario? But in football terms, because this is the Colts football podcast, if Patrick Mahomes has COVID-19, what happens? Because Mahomes getting COVID-19 and Joe Schmo getting COVID-19 is a pretty big difference. So I really don't know what the chances are of having a full season, but it's going to be an interesting ride in the 30 for 30 in a couple of years on 2020 sports from basketball getting shut down with Rudy Gobert getting it and the guys on the Utah Jazz when they were playing the Oklahoma City Thunder and then going into March Madness with the Big East canceling it in the middle of that St. John's game at halftime, March Madness tournament getting canceled, just all the crazy stuff that's happened up until this point, the battle between Rob Manfred, the owners, and the players in the MLB, and now as we go into this unorthodox month of July as we have the bubble in Orlando for the NBA and you have baseball coming back and baseball still going to be traveling and you have no DH in the NL and you have NL teams and AL teams with like a split schedule and you have these geographical matchups and then football it looks like everything's going to be normal but you lose those two preseason games which isn't really a big deal but you are going to have Teams traveling, they're going to try to get the full season in. Now you see the Ivy League canceled, the Patriot League canceled in college football and fall sports in college, and Stanford just cut 11 varsity programs. So it's just crazy, guys. We really don't know. I hope for the best. That's all you could ever do is hope for the best, hope that we get through this, and we will. We will pull through as a nation, as a society. But as sport fans, because sports are the great distraction. That's what I love so much about sports. You have a horrible day at work. You have a terrible day. Your girlfriend dumps you. Whatever happens in your life happens. Your family member gets sick. You lose a parent. You lose a loved one. Whatever happens, it's nice to lay on the couch at the end of the night, put on the TV, and watch sports. And to not have sports... In March, April, May, June, July. It's really weird. I've been watching ping pong. Russian Moscow ping pong every night. Because I miss sports. The TBT, the basketball tournament. The most generic name I've ever heard of. I've been enjoying that the past couple of days as well. So as a sport fan, not just a Colt fan, not just a football fan, but a sport fan. It's been a really weird time. So I hope everything goes back to normal. I hope everybody's safe and happy and healthy and People start to go back to work and kids start to go back to school, but in the safest manner possible. It's very sad to me that every little thing must become politicized and you have the right and the left. And then I think the people end up suffering the most in those situations. But to answer the question, I don't know if we'll have a full season. What are the chances? I think the NFL has the best chance because they start the latest And like I said before, with Roger Goodell, the show always goes on. So I think we'll have a season. Hopefully it's a full season. Hopefully we get 16 games plus playoffs in with the Super Bowl. Players stay healthy. Nobody gets sick. And life returns to normal. So guys, appreciate you listening to the For the Culture podcast. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, iHeart, Radio.com. Follow us on Twitter at For the Culture. And we'll be back this week. We have an interview with Yogi Roth of the Pac-12 Network to go over a couple of the guys Chris Ballard drafted out of the Pac-12, which will be a lot of fun right here on the Fourth Culture Podcast.